We are now at the end of the discussion of ultrasound features of grayscale mode. In this lecture we talk about the halo sign and the partly related ultrasound feature, the vascularization of thyroid nodules. Compared with the formerly presented suspicious characteristics, these share much less importance in the differential diagnostics, nevertheless in certain situations they may be of help. Most of the performance will be about the vascularity of the nodules, the halo sign requires much less discussion. So what is the halo sign? This is a hypoechoic ring that surrounds a part of a thyroid tissue and thus separates it from the rest of the thyroid gland. It is advisable to maintain the name halo for cases where the hypoechoic ring is complete. There are various explanations for the halo sign. Different histological entities are presented in the form of halo which may correspond to capsule or pseudocapsule or surrounding capsular vessels or compressed thyroid tissue. In these two small nodules, the presence of halo sign is obvious. Note the complete rim around both nodules. In larger lesions, it is more difficult to visualize the complete ring in the same section. In the left nodule, the halo is almost complete, but in the right case the halo can be seen only in part of the circumference of the lesion. Both cases prove to be follicular adenoma, Therefore, they had to be surrounded with the capsule. Another possible issue arises in hypoechoic nodule, particularly in deeply hypoechoic lesions. This situation is demonstrated in the left nodule, which proved to be a follicular adenoma. The halo sign was also absent in the right case, which also was diagnosed as follicular adenoma on histopathology. This case demonstrates that the perinodal vascularity can be of help in detection of capsule when halo is absent. But this will be discussed later. This table summarizes the findings of a meta-analysis. These data provide a very encouraging picture of the potential role of halo. The absence of halo significantly increases the incidence of cancer, the odds ratio is greater than that of microclassification. However, these numbers are deceptive None of the thyroid classifications or guidelines enlists the absence of halo among suspicious ultrasound characteristics. One of the main reasons for this is that in contrast for example to microclassifications, great proportion of benign nodules also lack the halo sign. The other is even more important. Follicular cancer behaves just the opposite of papillary cancer, the most common feature of a follicular neoplasia is the halo sign. So if we relied on the absence of halo, most follicular cancers would be overlooked. We have already mentioned several times that because overwhelming majority of thyroid cancers are papillary tumors, therefore the features of papillary cancer dominate our image of thyroid cancers. Papillary and follicular cancers behave quite differently for most suspicious signs. The differences are statistically significant regarding all features. The difference is not only of statistical importance, but these two types of cancer behave just the opposite. And this is the case also for halo. The occurrence of halo sign in follicular cancers is more than three times higher than in papillary cancer. There is another issue in this field. The conventional and the follicular variant of papillary cancer behave again differently. The differences are again not only of statistical significance, but except for non parallel orientation, the two forms of papillary cancers have a completely different ultrasound presentation. If we focus on the halo sign, the difference between the two forms of papillary cancer is of a similar order of magnitude as between follicular and papillary cancers. So, it is not surprising that none of the thyroid systems involve halo sign in their classification. Only the EACE mentions a special form of nodule with halo sign, among others, which are characteristics of the benign category. Now we turn to the second, more complex topic of this lecture. The vascularity of the nodule was the hottest topic in thyroidology 15 years ago. After the years of enthusiasm, 
it became clear that it will not bring salvation for thyroid problems. Essentially, two basic types of vascular patterns exist depending on the location where the flow can be visualized. The peripheral, or more exactly the perinodular, which means that blood flow can be detected at least 25% at the circumference of the nodule. This type of vascularization corresponds either to vessels running in a true capsule or to compressed vessels located outside the nodule in question. The second type of flow can be observed in the central part of the nodule and this is called intranodular vascularity. In contrast with the former, there is no definition in the literature for intranodular blood flow. One can speak of intranodular blood flow even if a single red spot is found. This minimal blood flow surely has other meaning compared with a chaotic type hugely increased vascularity. Not all professional companies deal with the circulation of nodules. For example, the American College of Radiologists does not mention nodules vascularity. Three different groupings can be read in the procedures. First, I present the classification of the European Thyroid Association. In the event of type 1 vascularity, there is neither perinodular nor intranodular flow. If peripheral flow predominates, we speak of type 2. If intranodular prevails, we speak of type 3 pattern. The former two subgroups have a relatively good negative predictive value for thyroid cancer, but this mainly shares statistical and not practical importance. The classification of the current Society of Thyroid Radiologists differs from the former in dividing intranodular patterns into two subgroups. In the first, the degree of intranodular flow is lower than 50%, while in the second, it is higher than 50%. The third classification was suggested by the AACE. This is very similar to the former ones, but does not number the subgroups. The dominant vascularity defines the categorization of a nodule according to its vascularity. I prefer this approach in ultrasound reports because, as opposed to numbering, it is clear. Use of words such as not relevant in a classification system reflects to the issues of vascularity. We lack clear definitions and therefore the inter-observer agreement is necessarily low. The visualization of vessels and blood flow depends largely on settings. It would be much more important if thyroid specialists agreed on whether to evaluate the circulation of the nodule alone or whether to compare the circulation to the blood flow of the extranodular tissue. The difficulty of standardization means that each device and each investigator uses different settings. This main difficulty could be resolved if we compare the nodule vascularity to the blood flow of the extra nodular tissue. So what is the relevance of nodule vascularity? It is obvious that compared to the suspicious characteristics, blood flow has much less relevance in the differential diagnostics. On the other hand, it may have importance in individual patients. Therefore, most guidelines suggest describing nodule vascularity on ultrasound report. The suggestions written in the second point correspond to the proposal of guidelines. It has more importance to detect the degree of intranodular flow than to detect its presence. As has been mentioned earlier, we have one definition regarding perinodular blood flow. We speak of this if flow is observed in at least 25% of the circumference of a nodule. This feature occurs more often in benign lesions. The cause for this is that in great proportion of cases, perinodular blood flow and halo signs show the same feature. The former does the vessels in the capsule, while the latter projects the capsule itself. Similarly to halo sign, Perinodular blood flow occurs significantly less frequently in papillary than in follicular cancer. The high occurrence of perinodular vascularity in follicular cancer is not surprising because this cancer by definition is surrounded with capsule. Firstly, I present an autonomously functioning adenoma. Left before the radioiodine therapy, right after the treatment. 
The presence of perinatal flow is obvious before the therapy, while after the therapy, the degree of perinatal flow became lower than 25%. These cases also present both perinatal flow and halo sign. In this follicular cancer case, the presence of halo is obvious, but the perinatal flow is observed in less than 25%. In such cases, I use the phrase signs of perinatal blood flow in my report. The presence of perinatal flow cannot be debated in the left nodule. The right case shows vascularization at the periphery of the nodule. However, the vessels seem to be located within the nodule. And the vessel marked with green does not follow the arc of the surface, which is marked with yellow arrows. Therefore, this pattern is equivocal. The other type of vascularity is the intranodular flow. I present the occurrence of this vascular pattern. The huge degree of overlapping points to the weakness of this sign in differential diagnostics. Some examples. The first two cases prove to be papillary cancers. In both cases, not only is intranodular vascularity present, but also markedly and irregularly enhanced. This nodule also presents increased intranodular flow, but the distribution is more uniform compared with the former represented nodules. The third type of vascularity is the lack of blood flow within or around a nodule. This pattern characterizes benign nodules. If blood flow is completely absent, it is not much to deal with. This unequivocal situation is presented in these nodules. If the intranodular vascularization is minimal, then the interpretation is more prone to individual judgment. The left case illustrates such a nodule. I only mention here and present one example for nodules with coarse calcification. In most of such nodules we cannot see blood flow dorsal to the calcified structure. Perinodular and intranodular flows are frequently combined. In such cases I prefer describing the presence of both types of vascularity and not only the seemingly predominate one. This can be observed in this nodule, which proved to be a follicular adenoma. This lesion proved to be papillary cancer. The nodule shows both perinodular flow and regularly distributed increased intranodular vascularity. The distribution of intranodular flow was irregular in this follicular adenoma, which also showed perinodular vascularity. The cytology resulted in benign lesion in the next case. Note that the vascular pattern should be classified differently at the two examinations. In the first, the perinodular flow was observed in less than 25% of circumference, while at the later visit the degree was above 25%. Intranodular flow could detect it at both times. We compare a benign follicular adenoma left to a papillary cancer right. Both nodules show perinodular and intranodular flow. They differ in the degree and distribution of intranodular blood flow. In contrast with the benign case, the papillary cancer presents more increased and irregularly distributed intranodular flow. Ok, we can demonstrate what we want to demonstrate. Unfortunately, we could present opposite examples as we will did in the case studies. Finally, I show some examples which are difficult to categorize. The first nodule shows signs of perinodular blood flow, but the extent is below 25%, so it cannot be categorized as perinodular blood flow. The lesion also presents signs of intranodular flow in the form of one single vessel in the right lower image. I do not think that this pattern should be categorized as intranodular vascularity. In the left case, the issue is the presence of intranodular flow. There are vessels clearly within the nodule, but these are found exclusively in the peripheral parts of the lesion. Should we speak of intranodular flow? Maybe. In the last examples, I present two cases in which the matter is the presence of perinodular flow. 
In the left case, there is a large vessel running at the medial part of the periphery of the nodule. Does this vessel correspond to an artery running within the capsule or does not? Taking the absence of other signs of peridineal flow as for in the nodule, in my opinion, it seems more likely that this large artery runs within the nodule, but I'm not fully convinced of it. The right papillary cancer was found in a Hashimoto's thyroiditis. It is obvious that the nodule lacks intranodular vascularity. The issue is whether the flow at the periphery of the lesion corresponds to perinodular vascularity or it is the presentation of vessels which are found in great number in the extranodular tissue. Now we turn to the overview of the literature regarding the role of vascularity in the differential diagnostics. Although the intranodular flow is the most common form of vascularity in malignant lesions, the odds ratio is much lower compared to other suspicious findings. Nevertheless, we cannot ignore this 3.75 value. Unfortunately, there are studies which seem to prove just the opposite. Yun and co-workers have found that intranodular vascularity is characteristics not of malignant but of benign lesions. This work cannot be disregarded because this is the largest study which involved only histologically verified nodules. It is extremely confusing to compare the conclusions of the two otherwise thorough works. This complete mess is very likely caused by the basic methodological issues discussed earlier. Based on these confusing and conflicting results, it is not surprising that neither thyroid system includes vascularity among those features on which they classify thyroid nodules. Only the AAC guideline mentions intranodular vascularization in its classification, but neither the presence nor the absence of intranodular flow influences the classification of the nodules. The various subtypes of thyroid cancers differ in their vascularization. While two-thirds of follicular cancers and follicular variant of papillary cancers present with high degree of intranodular vascularity, this ratio is less than 10% in conventional type papillary cancers. Another study found a higher ratio of intranodular vascularity in papillary cancer, while medullary cancer presented with an even higher occurrence. Our final theme focuses on the role of vascularity in other situations. I enlisted here the most important situations in which the vascularity can be of help. The first two of these situations are discussed in relative detail in the literature. First about the role of vascularity in the differentiation of lymph nodes. We present here the classification of lymph nodes according to Lenhardt and co-workers. We can see that the three types of nodes present with three different vascular patterns. Benign nodes are characterized by the presence of central vascularity. Unfortunately, this is frequently not detectable, therefore the absence has limited relevance. More important is the detection of abnormal vascular pattern, nevertheless this is the least important among suspicious ultrasound findings. The left case shows a vessel in the hilum, which would be the typical pattern of benign vascularity. In our practice, more than 80% of benign reactive type lymph nodes lack any blood flow. This situation is presented in the right case. The left node has a metastasis of a colon cancer. The node was avascular and lacked a regular hilum. In the right metastatic papillary cancer node, the vascularization was irregularly and diffusely increased. The left case had a hyperechoic mass within the node and this metastatic focus presented vascularity. The right metastasis of papillary cancer lacked hilum but showed vascularity. The left metastasis lacked hilum, the presence of scanty flow had limited importance. The right node contained the metastasis of a bezeroid cell cancer and was a vascular. These nodes had metastasis of thyroid cancer. 
The left case is clearly suspicious on the presence of irregular vascularity. The right pattern, which has multiple vessels, is also not a reassuring presentation. In the left node, the ultrasound is almost entirely diagnostic in itself for metastasis because this shows all possible suspicious signs. The node is heterogeneous, has a punctate echogenic focus, presents cystic degeneration and abnormal vascularity. In the event of the left node, the large vessel in the lateral part of the node was the most important suspicious sign. In dominantly cystic nodules, the vascularity helps us guiding fine needle aspiration cytology. We should aspirate vascularized portion of solid part. This table shows the risk of cancer in various ultrasound features. Increased vascularity increases the risk of malignancy. Nevertheless, the increased flow is of limited practical importance. However, the absence of vascularity might have greater role. Kim and co-workers have found no cancer if a cystic nodule lacked vascularization. The left nodule shows both perinodular and intranodular flow. The right case does dominantly perinodular vascularity. Both nodules prove to be papillary cancer. These images present also papillary cancer cases. Although the vascularization is scanty, both lesions present signs of intranodular flow. Papillary cancer is demonstrated in the left case, which lacked vascularity on Doppler mode. The right images came from an aberrant thyroid tissue, which shows numerous microcalcifications and cystic degeneration. The mass, which proved to be papillary cancer, lacked vascularity. In certain cases, blood flow can be of help in differentiating discrete lesions of Hashimoto thyroiditis. This slope has numerous hyperacuic areas. Only the lesion which showed perilesional flow proved to be nodule on histopathology. These images illustrate a coexistent papillary cancer and Hashimoto thyroiditis. There were two differences between the papillary cancer focus and the rest of the lobe. The tumor, which is marked with yellow arrows, was more inhomogeneous and in contrast to the extranodular tissue, the vascularization was decreased. In FD practice, there can be many individual cases for which no rule can be made. One of these is shown in the following pictures. In this patient, there was a papillary cancer in front of the thyroid gland, which could not be separated from the muscle in grayscale mode, but this was detected by vascularization. A muscle fiber is usually avascular and never presents such increased flow, which could be observed in this case. Finally, a theme to which we will dedicate a separate chapter in an upcoming section about the potential use of ultrasound signs of capsule. I mention it here because it presents a special possibility of the halo sign and vascularity. I have described two well-known facts here. The first is a definition, the second is a multiply confirmed observation. The follicular tumor must have a capsule, one of the signs of which is found in more than 90% of cases on ultrasound. And now a third one which points to the most important weakness of thyroid cytology. A follicular tumor can be differentiated only at histopathological examination because the distinction between a benign and malignant form depends exclusively on capsular and or vascular invasion. Okay. All endocrinologists are aware of these facts, but there is one more fact here that might escape attention. In large-scale studies, up to more than 50% of cytologically suspected follicular tumors prove to be not follicular tumor, but hyperplastic nodule. Why is this important? In contrast to follicular tumors, which must have a capsule, Hyperplastic nodules present capsule in around one-third of cases. If we draw the obvious consequence, then up to 20% of patients with cytologically suspected follicular tumors can avoid unnecessary surgery. The details are discussed in a later chapter. 
I present here two examples. In the first patient, cytology was performed in another hospital and this raised the suspicion of follicular cancer. However, the ultrasound pattern practically excludes the possibility of a follicular tumor, even the presence of pathological nodule is unlikely. This is one of the most typical ultrasound presentations of Hashimoto thyroiditis. We failed to convince the patient of all of this, who eventually underwent surgery. Histology found Hashimoto thyroiditis and no nodule. In the second patient, oxyphilic cells predominate the smear and based on this pattern an oxyphilic tumor can be raised. However, most oxyphilic tumors are either papillary variants or follicular variants. On the absence of cytological signs of papillary cancer, the possibility of the former could be excluded. While the ultrasound presentation strongly argues against the second possibility, nodules with such ultrasound pattern are unlikely being follicular tumors because of the absence of halo and the absence of perinodular blood flow. Fortunately or unfortunately, the take-home message section is very thin. Although the absence of halo is in a statistical term one of the strongest suspicious characteristics suggesting thyroid cancer in statistical term, we cannot rely on this sign because great proportion of benign nodules also lack halo. There are certain situations where the detection of vascularity can be of help. It seems obvious to utilize the ability of ultrasound in the differential diagnostics of follicular tumors, but strangely, we barely make use of this ability. It is considerable that there are many more potential in the vascularity of thyroid nodules, but this would require the hitherto missing standardization of the methodology. Thank you very much for your attention.